continue with our last lecture for part one of the class. This lecture covering incitement, duty of care, obscenity, and child pornography. I apologize for the abrupt ending to the last video, but a technical problem popped up and I had to stop the recording. But we'll make it through this and you'll have all the materials you'll need to prepare for the first exam. Just to recap, remember that incitement has several elements that must be present to find incitement. Number one, there has to be expression. Number two, there has to be an intent on the part of the speakers. And then specific criminal acts and a likelihood to produce the violent acts urged by the speaker. When we left off, we started talking about Rice versus Paladin Enterprises. Paladin publishing Hitman and How to Make a Disposable Silencer. Of course, this is an excerpt from the Hitman book in which Paladin uh, makes contract killers seem positively heroic. You saw from the last video that James Perry bought the two books. He wanted to go into the contract killing business. He was contacted by uh, Lawrence Horn, who hired him to kill his ex-wife, his son and his son's nurse. Uh, Mr. Perry committed the murders. He was discovered. Mr. Perry and Lawrence Horn were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted. Uh, Mildred Horn's maiden name was Rice, so her family sued uh, Paladin, and the family of Janice Saunders sued Paladin, alleging that the publisher was responsible for the murders under a theory of incitement. Now, in Discovery, remember from the preliminary videos that Discovery is where you have to tell the other side uh, what information you have. You have to show them your cards. And in Discovery, Paladin stipulated, that is to say, it uh, made a legal declaration that it was bound by, that it intended for its books to be used by contract killers. Even so, the trial judge dismissed the case on the grounds that the books did not amount to incitement and we're going to see the judge's reasoning here. Um, the judge concluded that there was nothing in Hitman or Silencers that might be characterized as a command to immediately murder the three victims. And he wrote in his opinion, nothing says go out and commit murder now. Instead, the judge said, the book merely teaches what must be done to carry out a contract killing and that it doesn't cross the line between permissible advocacy and impermissible incitation to crime or violence. So here, uh, we have expression, we have intent, um, we have a specific crime. Uh, the trial judge in this case says that what you're missing is the actual uh, words that cause someone to go out and do the bad thing. The Rice family and the family of Ms. Saunders appealed the decision of the trial court to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which reverses the grant of summary judgment, saying that a jury could decide if Paladin Enterprises had the necessary intent to incite the murders. And the Circuit Court of Appeals panel said that Paladin made this damaging stipulation and furthermore that it intended and had knowledge that the Hitman book would be used by criminals and would-be criminals to plan and execute a crime of murder for hire. So the appellate court uh, takes a look at the same record, same sets of evidence, and comes to a completely different conclusion than the trial court judge. And the Fourth Circuit goes so far as to say that the stipulation uh, included uh, Paladin Enterprises saying that it helped Mr. Perry uh, commit the murders that Paladin is being sued over. So the Fourth Circuit says, you will try the case. Paladin Enterprises appeals to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rejects the appeal and Paladin settles with the families. Let's move on to incitement in popular culture. Uh, 
Byers versus Stone. Um, this is Oliver Stone uh, and Warner Brothers. Uh, Mr. Stone and Warner Brothers uh, produced and distributed a movie called Natural Born Killers. It depicted a dystopian view of America in the near future in which a young couple, Mickey and Mallory, uh, go on a crime spree. They commit robberies. Everywhere they commit robberies, they commit murders. They kill everybody except one survivor who is supposed to live and tell the tale of Mickey and Mallory uh, having committed the crime. A young couple in Oklahoma, uh, not married, just going out together, very much in love with each other and very much in love with the movie Natural Born Killers. They would watch it constantly. Then one day they decided to act out the parts of Mickey and Mallory and they set off on a multi-state crime spree. Uh, they drove to Louisiana, stopped at a convenience store, uh, robbed it. There was only one person in the store, the clerk, um, Patsy Byers, and they shot her. They didn't kill her, but she was left a paraplegic. Um, she sued, and after she died of cancer, not related to the shooting, her family continued the suit, and the case made it through the trial court level. Uh, Oliver Stone and Warner Brothers sought to dismiss the case, and the trial court refused. But ultimately, a Louisiana Civil Court of Appeal overruled the trial court and dismissed the case, saying that there was no evidence of intent on the part of Oliver Stone or Warner Brothers to incite violence, uh, especially the violence of committing robberies and shooting the people um, where the robberies took place. The key in popular culture cases is going to be intent. Um, there are additional defenses to the First Amendment, but Generally speaking, intent is the thing that gets producers of popular culture off the hook. We have song cases. As you know, songs can be inspiring. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne and his song, The Suicide Solution, was blamed for the suicide of a teenage boy. Uh, he listened to the song over and over again, then he killed himself. His family sued Ozzy Osbourne. The case was dismissed by the trial court judge on the grounds that uh, there was no evidence of intent on the part of Ozzy Osbourne to cause suicide. In Pollard versus Slayer, a case that uh, comes to us from the Central Coast, um, uh, a um, teenage girl was kidnapped, tortured, raped, and murdered by three young men, wannabe death metal musicians. Pollard family, parents of the teenage girl, sued Slayer, the death metal group, saying that its songs inspired the three young men to commit the crimes that they did. The case was dismissed by the trial court judge, saying there was no evidence on the part of uh, Slayer uh, inciting listeners to commit specific criminal acts. Davidson versus Time Warner. Now, this case is interesting because not only does it include a claim for incitement, but it introduces a concept, a separate concept of liability called duty of care. And here's what happens. Ronald Howard is driving through Texas. He's pulled over by a Texas Highway Patrol trooper, Bill Davidson. As Trooper Davidson approaches the car, Mr. Howard uh, produces a nine millimeter pistol shoots Trooper Davidson, who dies of his wounds. Uh, Howard is caught. He's prosecuted at his trial. Uh, he says that he killed Trooper Davidson because uh, he had been listening to Tupacalypse Now over and over, and that uh, as uh, Trooper Davidson was approaching his car, it was as if he was watching himself pull out the 9mm and then pull the trigger and drive away. And his defense was that the album, or the CD, made him commit the crime. Trooper Davidson's family uh, attended his murder trial, 
and once the trial was over, they filed a lawsuit against Time Warner, which had distributed to Apocalypse Now. Now, the um, Davidson family said that Time Warner had a duty of care not to put out incitement. Duty of care uh, is pretty much what it sounds like. There's a duty, an obligation. And if an obligation of care exists, then a failure to meet that obligation creates liability to those people injured by the failure to act. Now, duty of care has um, a six-part test, a three-part test and a three-part test. The first of the three-part tests is to determine whether or not there would be an obligation. The second three parts is to determine whether the obligation is justified based upon uh, the difficulty in complying with avoiding injury. So it's a balancing test. And the first three-part test is, number one, the risk of harm. Uh, what is the risk associated with the expression? Second, very important, the foreseeability of the harm then the likelihood of injury. Now, you have to understand that the duty of care test is based upon at the time they release the record. Now, when you release the record, you don't have a crystal ball and you can't see the future. But when the finder of fact, the jury considers duty of care, they get to look back over time. They have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. And so what they do is they say, the record was released, let's say just for the sake of argument, on January 1st, here it is, December, we have seen these things happen in the 12 months. Based upon what happened after the release, we are now going to judge the record producer for its failure to predict when it released the record in January. And it's a little confusing, but. Most of our cases involve hindsight, and juries practice hindsight with 2020 vision. So, if you establish that there was an obligation, a duty, in the first part, then you balance that against whether or not uh, meeting that obligation is justified. So, the first part of the second three-part test is what is the social utility of the conduct then what would be the magnitude of the burden to prevent the injury and what would be the consequences of imposing that burden let's take a look at the Davidson case and the application of the three parts as you read in your book there was only one shooting connected to the CD and of course the CD had been out for a couple of years and 400,000 copies of the CD had been produced and distributed. So if you only had one shooting with 400,000 copies over a period of two years, did the CD create a risk of harm? No. If it didn't create a risk of harm, how foreseeable was the harm? Well, you've got one shooting, 400,000 copies, two years, and so it was not foreseeable. About three years. So we don't have two of the necessary elements of the first three part test. Now, the risk of harm, somebody being killed, that's uh, for the actual harm itself is pretty significant. But you have to look at this as a three part test. You can't win the test just with one out of three. Now let's uh, come back. The social utility of the conduct. If you don't establish the first half of the test uh, in, in uh, the legal system, you don't have to worry about the second. For purposes of the exam, you must do both sides of the the six-part test. So you look at the first three and then you have to look at the second three. 
the social utility of the conduct. What is the social utility of Tupacalypse now? I mean, what sort of message, how did it affect people? Um, was Tupac uh, saying something that needed to be said? If the utility of the CD is significant, then that's weight against finding an obligation on the part of the producer of the record. Secondly, what would be the magnitude of the burden of guarding against the injury? What was it in the CD that Mr. Howard said caused him to shoot Trooper Davidson? Well, at his trial, he just talked about listening to the CD over and over and over again. Does it mean that the entire CD would have to be uh, never released? Or does it mean that the lyrics would have to be uh, erased? What would have to be done to prevent Mr. Howard from being influenced by the CD? And then what would be the consequences of imposing the burden? Let's say Mr. Howard testifies that he listened to the whole CD over and over again and that, what, that is what caused him to shoot Trooper Davidson. If the, if the magnitude of the burden of guarding against the harm is not to have released the CD in the first place, the consequence is we don't have the CD. Uh, Tupac's words, uh, his sentiments are not shared with the public. If it is a particular song, then that means we take the one song off the CD. And again, people don't get to hear what Tupac is trying to tell them through his song. Or if it's all of the lyrics, then the magnitude of the burden of guarding against the injury would be to make it just an instrumental. And the consequences of imposing the burden by taking out all of the lyrics means you don't really have a CD, especially when it's rap music. So in the uh, Davidson versus Time Warner, the family fails to prevail on the first part of the test. The judge doesn't even have to go through the second. But on your exam, uh, if you get a, a popular culture liability question, you have to do the first three parts, and then you have to do the second three parts. And you weigh both parts against each other. And whichever has the greater weight means either there was an obligation which was not met by the speaker, or if the uh, second part of the test has greater weight, then you can say there might have been an obligation, but the obligation is outweighed by the harm caused by guarding against the bad result. So keep that in mind. Now, the uh, Davidsons also had an incitement claim saying that the CD incited the violence that resulted in the death of Trooper Davidson. The judge looked at that. We, of course, had a speaker. We had expression. Um, there was no intent because you can't really go back and say, well, Tupac, did you intend for people to shoot people after listening to the CD? Was there a specific language regarding shooting people or not? And was it likely to result in the shooting of somebody? The Davidsons argued that because Mr. Howard had in fact shot Trooper Davidson, because, as he claimed, he had listened to the CD, that that constituted incitement. And the judge in the case um, looked at it and he didn't go to intent, he didn't go to um, so much the words calling for a specific criminal act. He looked at the likelihood and he said, yes, weak-willed individuals might be influenced, but he continued swaying the weak will does not remove constitutional protection from speech. So the judge was saying, Yes, some people are so sensitive that they would commit a crime based upon listening to the CD, but the hypersensitive is not the test 
in the law. It is the reasonable person. And so here, uh, the judge said, uh, you can't use the example of Mr. Howard, uh, who obviously uh, was weak-willed, according to his own testimony in his trial, uh, for a finding of general liability uh, for the CD and the record company. So, the important thing for you to remember is that incitement is one way to find liability, and duty of care is a separate way to find liability. They are two separate ways to hold a, a speaker accountable. Don't mix them. Keep your incitement portion of the answer separate from your duty of care portion of your answer, because if you start to mix them up, then you will not do very well on the exam, and you will also not do very well when you're out as a practicing media professional. Continuing with popular culture, uh, movies, websites, and games, Sanders versus Acclaimed Entertainment. Uh, this is a suit arising from the Columbine uh, killings. Uh, the family of the teacher who was killed uh, sued uh, computer game makers, uh, movie makers, and websites. And the family argued that the video games Doom, Redneck, Rampage, uh, trained both Harris and Thebold how to kill. That uh, it made it easier. It, it showed them how easy it was to point a weapon and pull the trigger and kill somebody. They also sued the producer of the movie Basketball Diaries because in that movie, at the end, the protagonist goes to his school and kills the teacher and classmates. And they said, well, that was definitely inspiring and inciting both uh, Harris and Klebold. And finally, they sued adult websites saying that uh, pornography, which is, well, let me see. Pornography is unrealistic. Uh, things happen in pornos that really never happened to actual people living in the world. And by offering that fantasy, it divorced Harrison Klebold from reality and made it easier for them to kill because it was like they weren't really killing people because they were operating in a fantasy world. The trial court judge dismisses the claims and it did so on the grounds that there was no duty of care. Uh, and there was no duty of care because uh, Klebold and Harris's attack was not foreseeable. Because it wasn't foreseeable, it didn't meet the first half of the test. The judge didn't go into the second half of the test because he'd already disposed of the case. But remember, as I said before, when you answer a test question on liability for popular culture, you are going to have to do both halves of the test. Well, well, the judge actually did look at the second, talk about the social utility of the um, games, the website, and the movie, and then going back to the first half showing that there was no evidence that the products caused the violence. Another popular culture case, James versus Mail Media. Uh, this is in connection with a school shooting in Paducah, Kentucky. In this case, the trial court tosses out the lawsuit of the families of those who were shot, saying there was no duty of care and that the defendants did not cause the deaths. So here we're looking at duty of care no foreseeability. Um, secondly, saying that the defendants did not cause the deaths goes to an incitement theory. Right? There was expression, there was no intent, um, and there was no evidence that the expression would cause people to go out and uh, commit shootings. But then we have the one case with incitement in popular culture and duty of care in popular culture, 
that wasn't dismissed. Um, Devin Moore, a young man who loved Grand Theft Auto, the computer game, watched it all the time. One day, he stole a car, uh, took it home. The police went to his home, found the stolen car, went inside the house, found him playing Grand Theft Auto, arrested him, took him down to the police station. Now, this is a very small police department. So you have the two arresting officers down in the police station. The only other person in the police station was a dispatcher. One officer left the booking area, went to a different part of the station. Uh, the second officer released Mr. Moore from his handcuffs. When he did so, Moore grabbed the officer's pistol and shot him in the head. Uh, the other officer ran back to the booking area and Mr. Moore shot him in the head. And then he uh, made his, his escape, went past the radio room and shot the dispatcher in the head. He stole a police car. Later he was captured. And he said famously at his trial, life is a video game, everybody dies. Well, the families of the police officers and the dispatcher sued Sony Entertainment, which is the company that owns Rockstar Entertainment, which is the company that puts out Grand Theft Auto. Sony moved for dismissal on the grounds that, number one, there was no incitement, number two, there was no duty of care, and number three, that the video game was entitled to First Amendment protection because it was an item of expression. The trial court refused to dismiss the case and the appellate courts refused to dismiss the case. After the appellate courts refused to dismiss the case, um, it disappears. There's no report of what happened, uh, there's no trial which leads to the conclusion that Sony settled the case rather than actually go to trial and have a bad judgment which could be used against it in later cases. But Strickland is the only case where the courts did not, out of hand, dismiss the claim because, number one, there's no intent for incitement, number two, there's no foreseeability for duty of care. see uh, Devin Moore and his famous words from his trial were actually after his arrest. And you can see that uh, Sony advocated its First Amendment claim, but the Alabama Supreme Court rejected the argument and said, no, uh, there can be liability here. The jury will get to decide. Then we have the Nuremberg site case. ACLA, A-C-L-A, is the American Coalition of Life Activists. Uh, they are opposed to abortion and they believe that uh, at some point uh, in America we will realize that abortion is murder and that abortion providers will wind up facing trial just as uh, the Nazis faced trial for crimes against humanity at Nuremberg. They went to a convention, there was a poster session, and ACLA uh, came up with a poster, which was a wanted poster, as from the Old West, where you would have the picture of the wanted person, the crimes that they were accused of, and a reward. And for its wanted poster, the ACLA group uh, put the photographs and names and addresses of abortion providers, doctors who provide abortions. And it was a big hit at the convention. Uh, so much so that ACLA decided that it would give greater exposure and so on its website it posted the wanted poster which featured doctors who provide abortions, had their pictures, their names, their addresses. And if a doctor was killed 
they would put a gray screen over his picture. In other words, they would show that he, he was no longer providing abortions. Same thing if a doctor was attacked and injured. And ACLA members would go online and talk about how great it was that this doctor, this, this murderer of innocent unborn children had gotten his just desserts. Well, Planned Parenthood of Willamette County um, saw this Nuremberg site and the wanted poster. And they said, you are inciting violence against abortion providers. And so they sued. In trial, the trial court judge made a conclusion that the poster online constituted true threats against the doctors. A three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit reverses the trial court judge, but then the entire Ninth Circuit rehears the appeal, and they affirm the trial court judge. The majority say, "Here, this this is uh, this is in fact a real threat." The Supreme Court refused to hear the case, uh, and ultimately, um, Willamette County Planned Parenthood was left with a reduced um, damage award. Now, this is a civil case, it's not a criminal case. Uh, and in a civil case, the only thing you can sue for is money. But um, here, the Planned Parenthood doctors won their case uh, because the courts found that the poster constituted a true threat. Uh, therefore, it was an incitement. Uh, there also can be a duty of care in putting the poster online. And that takes care of incitement and duty of care. Remember, they are two separate, two distinct ways of finding liability on the part of a publisher. Next, let's turn to obscenity. Uh, obscenity law comes from England. Um, and from the last video where I was addressing some comments from student blogs, uh, you know that we have a lot of English law because we started out practicing English law in the colonies. In America, in colonial America, there were restrictions on lascivious writings and mocking sermons and immoral songs and poems. They were local in nature. They were violations of community standards of the time and the place. But obscenity law, as a national standard, uh, comes to us from England in the case of Regina versus Hickman. Uh, if there had been a king in England at the time, it would have been Rex versus uh, Hickman, but England had a queen at the time, so it's Regina versus Hickman. It is the first significant case brought under Lord Campbell's Act. Uh, Lord Campbell's Act uh, made obscenity a criminal offense in England by statute. Uh, before Lord Campbell's Act, obscenity cases were brought under common law. So here's what happened. Uh, Henry Scott, not Hicklin, um, who was a staunch Protestant and anti-Catholic, would purchase pamphlets with the title of the Confessional on Mass, uh, showing the depravity of the Romish priesthood and that is actually the title. Uh, shoeing uh, was the way they would write showing. Hicklin sold these pamphlets in his hometown. Uh, the pamphlet was printed in Latin and English. Half of the pamphlet was the reasons why Catholicism was a bad thing. The other half was about what priests did to women at the confessional box and with nuns in the convents. And that half, which talked about the sexual activity of the priests and the women uh, was what got uh, Mr. Scott in trouble. A police officer learned about the pamphlets, got one, uh, knew that Mr. Scott was selling them, and so he arrested Mr. Scott, seized the pamphlets that he still had in his house, and took him in front of a magistrate. The magistrate said, well, these pamphlets have lascivious content. They are talking about people doing the rumba, and he ordered their destruction. 
Now, you have magistrate, and above the magistrate, you have judges. Well, Judge Benjamin Hicklin reversed the order to destroy the pamphlets. And his reasoning was, yes, they have um, people doing the rumba, but these pamphlets are used for political purpose to argue against Catholicism and to help prevent the Catholics from uh, winning seats in Parliament. And so it is Judge Hicklin's order that is the subject of the case in Regina versus Hicklin. His order was appealed, and Lord Alexander Cogburn wrote the opinion of the English court upholding the magistrate and reversing Judge Hicklin. Uh, Judge uh, Lord Cogburn's opinion lays out the test for obscenity, and his test was whether the tendency of the matter charged as obscene is to deprave and corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences. Uh, in plain English, uh, Lord Cogburn was saying, uh, if we think that this material, a uh, book, painting, poem, song, whatever, if we think this material would uh, corrupt the minds of those people who would be susceptible, then it is obscene. Now, whose minds would be open to such immoral influences? Well, the test would be of children, women, and mental defectives. Now, realize that we're, at the time of this case, in a very chauvinistic and male-centric society. So it's not that men would be corrupted, but because the material could corrupt a child or a woman or a mental defective, well, that made it obscene. The other part of the test was that they didn't actually have to bring a woman, child, or a mental defective into court, have them read the book or look at the painting uh, or hear the song or the poem and see if they became corrupted and depraved. No, the test was whether or not the judge or the jury would decide that the material would corrupt children, women, and mental defectives. Uh, there was no need of proof. Uh, it would simply be the judgment of the judge or of the jury. The second part of the, uh, of the analysis from Lord Cogburn was that if a work contains one obscene passage, the whole work is obscene. So if you have a thousand page book and there's one sentence in there that talks about doing the rumba, then the whole book is obscene, according to the Hicklin rule. And keep in mind that obscenity law is not about an actual harm or crime from consuming obscenity. Uh, the impure thoughts resulting from seeing obscene materials is sufficient to justify punishing the speaker. So we have thought crime. Um, you're putting out materials that would make people think the wrong things, Therefore, we're going to put you in prison. The Hicklin Rule, of course, coming from the English courts, it was first adopted in the United States in 1879. The Supreme Court heard a case in 1896 which applied the Hicklin Rule, and they said, well, we think this is a good rule, and in 1896 that became the standard for the whole of the country. And that's the way it was for decades. Uh, if you published a dirty book, you were at risk of being prosecuted for polluting the minds of those who read it. But then things started to change just a little bit. And we have the case of United States versus one book called Ulysses. It's an interesting uh, caption. If you have never lived on the border, uh, you may not be familiar with uh, customs forfeiture. So the book Ulysses, written by James Joyce, uh, considered a classic, very earthy, very powerful, um, but which contained, um, well, scenes in which people are doing the rumba. Uh, it was considered to be obscene by American authorities, and it was 
on a list of books which were not permitted to be brought into the United States. An actress who had been touring Europe bought a copy of the book, read it on the ship that came to the United States. When she landed in New York, uh, a customs agent uh, looking through her things sees the book, checks it off against the list and says, ah, this is an obscene book and so I'm seizing this from you. All right, now we're going to take a little aside. Uh, customs forfeiture. Uh, then this goes back to uh, when I used to cover uh, federal agencies on the border in El Paso, Texas. Well, at the time, and it's still the case, uh, marijuana was not legal. Drugs were not legal. And so, because they weren't legal, uh, you could make a pretty good amount of money by smuggling drugs into the country and selling them. So, you would try to conceal bundles of marijuana in your car, try to drive through the port of entry, and hope that the customs people there didn't detect the marijuana. And people tried all sorts of things. They would uh, a hole in the spare tire and jam marijuana and other drugs into the spare tire. They would stick the material up in fender wells behind bumpers. They would stick it under car seats. And of course, um, very often the customs people would have drug sniffing dogs which could uh, then detect the drugs. So let's say that you uh, have your car, you stuff it with marijuana, you drive to the port of entry, the customs drug sniffing dog detects marijuana in your vehicle, they find it, they arrest you for attempting to smuggle drugs into the country, they also take your car. You're in jail and your car is in federal custody, it goes to a big impound lot. While you're waiting to stand trial, the government then institutes a forfeiture proceeding against your car. And so there is a judge who sits in on these cases, and what they do is um, the U.S. attorney comes into the courtroom. They say, it's the United States versus your car. The U.S. attorney says, well, I'm present, ready to proceed. And the judge asks, is there a lawyer for the car? And pretty much all the time, there is no lawyer for the car because you're spending all your money on a lawyer for yourself. Because there is no lawyer for the car, then the car forfeits. And so it becomes property of the United States. It can be destroyed. It can be sold at auction. And that's what happened with this book. Uh, only in this case, the publisher hired a lawyer for the book. So when Judge Woolsey opened up the proceeding for forfeitures one day, the U.S. Attorney stood up and said, U.S. Attorney here for the government, ready to proceed. And then the judge says, is there an attorney for the book Ulysses? And the lawyer stood up and said, yes, Your Honor, I am the attorney for the book Ulysses and we are ready to proceed. Well, that meant that there was actually going to be a case. There were going to be arguments made back and forth. Uh, Judge Woolsey heard from the U.S. Attorney, oh, this is a terrible book, it's dirty, it contains obscenity, people were doing the rumba. And he heard from the lawyer for the book, no, this is a work of great art, uh, it has passages that reflect real life. And then he says, well, we're going, I'm going to put off my decision for a while. We'll come back to this, but for now I'm putting off my decision. Then, Judge Wolsey uh, goes down to the impound room and he takes a bunch of copies of the book because it's been seized from a number of people coming back from Europe. He takes them home. He has a dinner party with good friends, people he considers to be well-read, uh, smart. And at the end of the dinner party, he says, here, I'm, I want you to read this book. He, he has a book club for a book being seized as I've seen, said, read the book and let's have another dinner party in a couple weeks and tell me what you think. Well, 
uh, his guests take the book, go home. A couple of weeks later, they have another dinner party. He says, what do you think of the book? And his guests are, this is a great book. This is a powerful book. This is a book that is about real life. And he says, well, is it, is it a dirty book? He said, no, there's some stuff that relates to people being in love and doing what people naturally do. So Judge Woolsey then goes back to court. He reopens the hearing on United States versus one book called Ulysses. And he changes the Hicklin rule. He says, I'm not going to find this book obscene on the basis of some selected passages from the book. The rule now in my courtroom is that if you want to say something is obscene, you have to show me that it is obscene in its entirety rather than on some isolated passage or a few brief uh, references to people doing the rumba. And so that eroded the power of the Hicklin rule. Now, there were a number of other cases about obscenity that went through the courts, and in your syllabus I've instructed you not to read them because as media practitioners, you're going to be dealing with contemporary law, including contemporary law of obscenity, which means that invoking the Roth case does you no good because Roth has been replaced by the current rule on obscenity. And if you try to apply the Roth test, you'll be applying a test that is no longer being used. So I didn't want you to read those cases. They can only be confusing. Uh, let's move on to cases that uh, help us understand modern obscenity. And we start with Redrup versus New York. Um, here, you're familiar with girly magazines. Um, you're familiar with them today in their current incarnation. Uh, but back when the Redrup case came up, girly magazines consisted of women who were at the most topless. Uh, you didn't have the full frontal nudity or the gynecological examination that we have in some girly magazines today. But the police would arrest folks selling girly magazines on the grounds that the magazines were obscene. And so uh, cases kept coming up. They would be appealed sometimes to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was having difficulty with getting all these cases, and we can't really decide on a good standard. So um, Redrup is the lead uh, appellant in three cases that are heard by the Supreme Court all at once. And the court says, well, um, we're going to um, overturn the conviction. And we're going to overturn the conviction because we don't have a good way of defining obscenity. And if we can't define obscenity, then how can we hold somebody uh, guilty for selling obscene materials? So without a definition of obscenity, and just looking at the magazines as magazines, the Supreme Court said, it's a publication, it's expression, and therefore it is protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendments. The First Amendment, of course, protecting expression, freedom of speech, and of the press. The Fourteenth Amendment applying the First Amendment to the individual states, because this is a case brought in New York State. So, that kind of made assembly prosecutions more difficult. Then we have the case of Ginsburg versus New York. Now, as I say in the syllabus, don't confuse this with Ginsburg with a Z. You should have read Ginsburg with an S. In Ginsburg, uh, you had Sam Ginsburg, Ginsburg who uh, ran a little luncheonette and sundry store in upstate New York. Very popular guy, well known in the community. One day, a mother comes home, uh, does the laundry, goes up to put the laundry away in her son's room, and when she opens the door, she finds that he is reading a girly magazine. And of course, he's all embarrassed, and she's shocked. Um, she tells him to come downstairs with the magazine. Uh, she asks him where he got that filth, and he says, well, I bought it at Sam's uh, Luncheonette the business owned by Sam Ginsburg. So the mom takes the magazine, calls the police and says, 
Sam is selling dirty magazines. I'm going to go there. I want you to meet me there. So the police come to uh, Sam's luncheonette. Uh, the mom shows them the magazine, and then she hands her son, teenage son, some money. Says, "Go inside and buy some more of these." And of course, the kid is embarrassed. Doesn't want to do it, but it's mom. So he goes inside the store, buys magazines, brings them out. The mom hands the magazines to the police, which then, who then arrest Mr. Ginsburg uh, for selling materials harmful to minors. Uh, now, uh, Ginsburg is famous in the town. He's always helpful. If there's a charity event, he's always helping out. If there's a, a youth uh, league of some sort, he helps to provide money for the uniforms and other uh, equipment. Uh, he is so well liked that the town takes up a collection to pay his bail to get him out of jail. He is prosecuted and convicted of violating a New York statute that makes it a crime to sell or distribute to minors material that is harmful to them. And the New York statute uh, defines uh, nudity as being harmful to kids to see. He appeals his conviction all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, consider the Redrick case. The Supreme Court, for an adult, would say, well, no, we, we don't really think this is obscene because we don't know the test for obscenity. But because Ginsburg has sold his magazine to a minor, the court says, um, well, that's obscenity. And the court creates the concept of variable obscenity, Variable obscenity means that it could be a girly magazine which is not obscene for adults, but in the hands of children, it is obscene. The variation, the variability, is whether it is an adult who is consuming it or a child who is consuming it. And of course, they put the, the floor requirement that the material has to have nudity or people doing the rumba. So keep that in mind. Ginsburg, still good law. Stanley versus Georgia. Uh, here we talk about protections and the right to receive uh, ideas, even ideas about the rumba. Um, Georgia authorities were investigating Mr. Stanley because they thought he was a bookmaker. Now, if you're not familiar with the term bookmaker, it's all right. It's probably a good thing that you're not. But um, bookmaking is illegal gambling. If you don't live in Las Vegas or Nevada or other places that have legalized gambling and you wanted to make a bet on a sporting event, uh, let's say you wanted to bet on uh, Cal Poly playing the Gauchos and you thought Cal Poly was going to win and you wanted to express your support for the team by betting $50 with somebody that Cal Poly would win, you could do that with someone you know or you could find a bookie bookie a term for bookmaker. Uh, it's called bookmaking because when you take bets from a lot of people, you have to have a record of who made what bet, how much, what the terms of their winning would be, and it's impossible to keep this all in your head unless you are a savant. And if you are, you don't need to be a bookmaker. So bookmakers would create books. They would write down the bets so that after the sporting event they would know who to pay money to and who to collect money from. And that would be evidence of illegal gambling. People would want to find the book. Now, bookies started out with uh, paper books, but those could be seized by the police, so they used a variety of ways to be able to dispose of the book Sometimes they would write it on flash paper so that if the police came in, they could uh, snap their fingers on the paper and it would burst into flames and be consumed. They would write it on rice paper so that if the police came in, they would throw the rice paper into a bucket of water. The rice paper would dissolve. There's no evidence of bookmaking. So the police went to Mr. Stanley's home looking for evidence of bookmaking, which meant that they looked at more than just books or pamphlets or tablets. They found three film canisters and a film projector. And it's possible that Mr. Stanley, as a bookmaker, might have taken images of his 
vets and put them in the film. So they hauled out the projector and watched all three films. Uh, the films didn't contain uh, bookmaking, no evidence of vets, but the films did contain people doing the rumba. And so Mr. Stanley was arrested and convicted for possession of three obscene films. He appealed his conviction and the Supreme Court overturned the conviction. Uh, Justice Marshall, uh, who wrote the opinion for the court, provided two primary reasons for overturning Mr. Stanley's conviction. One is based upon the First Amendment and a right to receive information and ideas regardless of the value they have to society. You know, you can, well, you should read some uplifting and edifying book, but you also have the right to read trash. So the First Amendment right to receive information and ideas, uh, he was entitled to watch those movies in the privacy of his home, which then goes to the second reason for overturning his conviction. He had a Fourth Amendment right. Remember, Fourth Amendment is the one that is uh, protection against unreasonable search and seizure. And so Justice Marshall said he, Mr. Stanley had a constitutional right of privacy against the intrusion by the government to interfere with the reception of information and ideas in the privacy of his home. So Mr. Stanley's conviction was reversed. Now, the principle behind Stanley, enunciated by Justice Marshall, is still good law. But then people overread what that opinion by the Supreme Court was. In the United States versus Riddell, Riddell was convicted of distributing obscene materials um, and Mr. Riddell said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Mr. Stanley has the right to consume these obscene materials in the privacy of his home, how did they get there? Well, the only way they can get there is if people like me sell them to Mr. Stanley. Therefore, if Stanley has a right to possess them, I must have a right to distribute them so that he can have them in the privacy of his home. And the court said, too bad, so sad, Mr. Riddell. Uh, no, if you have it in the privacy of your home, that's fine. But selling this stuff, no, that's still a violation of the obscenity law. And they said a right to possess is not a right to distribute. Then we had Byrne versus Carolexis. Um, in this case, the operator of an adult movie theater um, I know today that if people want to look at porn, they can go online or they can go buy a CD. Um, but in the old days, because we didn't have VCRs or DVD players, if you wanted to watch people doing the rumba on screen, you would go to an adult theater. Here, the theater is playing the Swedish film I Am Curious Yellow, and they're busted by the cops, charged with purveying obscenity, displaying obscenity, convicted. Uh, in this case, the operators of the adult theater say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, we're not selling this to people out on the streets. What happens is people have to come to our theater and we have a sign on the door that says nobody under 21 is allowed inside and we, we enforce that policy. And when people come inside, they have to buy a ticket and that ticket entitles them to sit in a seat in the movie theater to watch the movie. So the adult movie theater operators were saying, well, we're selling people a place to sit and stay. It's like they're renting the seat, just as Mr. Stanley could be renting his house or renting an apartment. We're doing the same thing. And the court said, well, too bad, so sad. Uh, purchasing or renting a seat in a movie theater is not the same thing as purchasing or renting a home where you can sit and watch a dirty movie. So Stanley, a lot of people thought it had great promise to protect them. But it didn't. Stanley is limited to the right to possess and receive ideas in the privacy of your own home without the government intruding. United States versus Extreme Associates. This case is here as a cautionary tale for you. 
um, and I've included it because of the exam, and I'll go into this a little, in a little more detail in just a minute. So Extreme Associates operates websites. Uh, don't bother looking for them. Uh, they are nasty websites. Um, the U.S. Attorney brought a 10-count indictment against Extreme Associates, uh, alleging that they were distributing obscene material to the Internet. The trial court judge, Judge Lancaster, dismisses the indictment. He says, it's gone away, it's, you're, you're free to go. And he does so by looking at obscenity laws in general. He applies strict scrutiny. Now, if you go back into the appendix of the book, you can look at the definitions and find that strict scrutiny is the test, the constitutional test of whether or not a law is constitutional. It is the highest scrutiny that we give to laws, and we apply it most often with respect to expression. So strict scrutiny, there you go. It's a three-part test, three-part test all over the place in media law. Number one, the government has to show there's compelling interest for justifying the law. Two, the narrow, law has to be narrowly tailored, and three, there is no less restrictive alternative to the law in achieving the compelling interest. So, um, three part, you have to show the compelling interest. The law has to focus only on that compelling interest and there can't be another way to achieve the compelling interest other than making something illegal. Judge Lancaster and Extreme Associates says there's no compelling interest for the government to prosecute people who went to the Extreme Associates website because there's no compelling interest for the government to make obscenity a crime. He, of course, is overruled by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Third Circuit says, we've had obscenity laws for more than 30 years. Now, 30 years is based upon um, the case that brought us the contemporary standard for obscenity laws. The Third Circuit panel says, Judge Lancaster, what are you doing? You're trying to overrule the Supreme Court, and lower courts may not substitute their judgment for that of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the highest law in the land, and all the courts under it are inferior to the Supreme Court. And the Third Circuit says, if the Supreme Court has ruled on the issue, then the Supreme Court is the only judicial body that can change the rule. And what that means is, if the Supreme Court rules one way, and you're a trial court judge, you have to follow the Supreme Court ruling. If the defendant doesn't like the rule, the defendant then has to appeal your judgment to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and then appeal the Circuit Court of Appeals, which also must follow the Supreme Court rule, to the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court decides it wants to rehear that rule and reconsider it, then it can. And if it decides it doesn't like the old rule, it'll change the rule. Uh, but most often it does not. So the Supreme Court has settled the issue. Trial court judges can't come up with their own law. How does this relate to the test? Well, back when I first started teaching media law, I had a very clever and inventive student. In some of the exam questions, I make you, the student, the judge you have to rule on a particular controversy. Um, and this one student early on in my teaching said, well, I'm a judge, therefore I'm ruling this way. It was contrary to contemporary law. But as he wrote in his answer, you made me the judge, I have power in my courtroom, and this is how I rule. And because um, technically he was correct, because I hadn't included uh, U.S. versus Extreme Associates uh, in the class before that, I had to give him full credit. So I've solved that problem. Uh, Extreme Associates is here to remind you that whatever the Supreme Court has ruled is the law of the land. And on the test, I will even make reference. Remember, Extreme Associates, you can't come up with some gonzo ruling because I've made you a judge for a question. You still have to follow contemporary law. So it's in here 
to make sure that you don't try to get too clever because if you get, get too clever, you might just clever yourself out of a passing grade. All right, now let's come to the obscenity standard, the one that is in place today. It comes to us from the case of Miller versus California. Uh, and what happened is Mr. Miller was selling uh, dirty books. He mailed uh, advertisements, full color advertisements uh, to places around California. Uh, some of the advertisements landed at a restaurant in Newport Beach when the mother and son who owned the restaurant sat down to open the mail, uh, they opened the envelopes and out popped these four colored glossy photos of people doing the rumba. They called the police. And then California authorities prosecuted and convicted Mr. Miller. He appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court affirmed the conviction that Mr. Miller and announced a three-part test for what was obscene and what was not obscene. The three-part test is this. Number one, does the work appeal to prurient interest? Prurient uh, is a term that, that uh, means a sick or morbid interest, uh, and it's a prurient interest in sex. Second, does the work portray sexual conduct in a patently offensive way? And third, does the work lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? That's the three-part test for obscenity. So, if the work appeals to prurient interest, if it portrays sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, and if it lacks slaps values, then it is obscene. But, if it doesn't have all three of those, then it is merely pornography and is protected by the First Amendment and we have no pornography arrests and convictions. So the SLAPS test, serious, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Here we are. Um, we have Michelangelo's Statue of David, we have Goya, the new uh, Naja, well, David, you can see David's doodle. Is that an obscene statue? Well, there's artistic value there. Because it has artistic value, it is not obscene. Same thing with the famous Goya painting. Uh, the artistic value uh, means that it is not obscene. Well, let's go back here for just a second. Important for you to know, the first two parts of the tests, does the work appeal to prurient interest in sex, and is the work patently offensive? Those two parts of the test are judged on contemporary community standards. So if we had an obscenity prosecution in San Luis Obispo, the jury, the finder of fact, would be asked to judge whether the work appeals to prurient interest based upon the standards of the community of San Luis Obispo. The jury would then be asked, does the work portray sexual conduct in a patently offensive way based upon the contemporary community standard of San Luis Obispo? The first two, community-based. The third part, the SLAPS test, that is objectively based. In other words, it's not based upon whether a local community considers this work to be artistic or not whether the local community considers the work to have uh, literary value or not. No, this is an objective, if you will, national test. And it's going to come into play in subsequent cases. <coughs> Jenkins versus Georgia. Uh, Billy Jenkins is the manager of a movie theater in Georgia. The movie theater is showing a film, Cardinal Knowledge, which um, despite its title, does not actually show people doing the rumba. Um, but Billy Jenkins is arrested, convicted, and sent to prison on an obscenity charge from Georgia. The Supreme Court says they're not doing the rumba in the movie, there are no sexual acts, therefore it cannot be obscene. For obscenity to take place, you must have people doing the rumba. 
in the Maplethorpe case. Um, you may or may not know Robert Maplethorpe. He was a photographic artist. If you ever go to New York, the Guggenheim Art Museum has a permanent collection of his photographs. So you can go up onto the upper floors and see his works. Um, he uh, did a lot of his work uh, depicting uh, gay, male, sadomasochistic poses. The Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati uh, had a traveling exhibition, exhibition of works by artists, and one of the artists in the exhibition was Robert Maplethorpe. Now, the director of the art center went to see the sheriff in Cincinnati County, Sheriff May, and according to the director of the art center said, well, I, I showed him photographs that we were going to have in the exhibition, and he said, there's no problem. The sheriff, on the other hand, said, um, actually, he showed me photographs, but he didn't show me photographs of all the pictures in the Maplethorpe part of the exhibition. So when I said there was no problem, the pictures he showed me were fine, but the pictures he didn't show me, there was the problem. And that's why we came down and uh, arrested him and prosecuted the art center over the Maplethorpe pictures. Now, the Maplethorpe pictures showed men in uh, some sadomasochistic poses. There were also a couple of photos of uh, girls who had lifted their, the hems of their skirts and the case went to trial. The prosecution was convinced that the good people of Cincinnati who were on the jury would be terribly upset by the Maplethorpe photos because you have to understand this is some decades ago before there was uh, as much acceptance of, of uh, being gay as there is now. So the prosecution was satisfied that the local jury using Cincinnati community standards would find that the work appealed to a prurient interest in sex, that the jury would find based upon contemporary community standards in Cincinnati that the works were patently offensive. So is the Contemporary Arts Center out of luck? Well, remember, there's the third part of the test, the SLAPS test. Uh, does the work lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? prosecution brings in one expert on art whose uh, credentials are that uh, the expert was a former songwriter for a children's television show and of course the expert says well these are not artistic at all they're just smut they're just filth and dirt and the prosecution says great I've established that the exhibition has no slaps value but then the defense brings in a dozen experts, people who are directors of art museums, uh, persons who are uh, professors of art, and they all say that Maplethorpe's photographs are great art, that uh, they represent a bold new direction in photographic uh, artistry. The jury then gets the case, they retire to the jury room, they come back, not guilty. They talked to the jurors and they said, yes, these are terrible pictures. We hate these pictures. These pictures are disgusting. But the experts said they had artistic value. And so we agree with the experts they have artistic value. Therefore, they are not obscene. They don't meet the definition. They don't fail the test of obscenity. Then we have um, two live crew. Two Live Crew, of course, came out with a CD uh, as nasty as they want to be. They created a music video of the songs on As Nasty as They Want to Be. A judge in Florida ruled that the music video was obscene, ruled that the CD was obscene, um, and said that it would be uh, a case of obscenity if anybody sold the CD in the county where the Florida judge was. Well, a record store owner went ahead and sold the CD. It was, one of them was purchased by a sheriff's deputy. He was prosecuted and convicted. Two Live Crew um, 
had a live concert in the county. And the Sheriff's Department uh, sent in undercover deputies to record the concert. Uh, at the end of the concert, uh, the deputies went up and arrested the two live crew and they were prosecuted. Um, True Life Crew's defense was that their songs and music video had literary value. And they brought in experts to say, well, they may be singing about, um, well, we've heard the word before, they're singing about hoes, but that's not what they mean. It's poetry. And as you know, in poetry, the words don't mean what they say, that the word represents something else entirely. On the basis of the experts who talked about the literary value of two live crews uh, music and other experts who talked about the artistic value of two live crew songs, there was an acquittal for two live crew based upon Slash. Now, the record store owner uh, didn't have any of these experts, so his conviction, uh, he was convicted, and his conviction stood. He didn't have the same resources as the group. Now let's move on to child pornography. As I've said before, child pornography is a misleading term. It makes uh, evidence of the sexual abuse of children seem to be a part of pornography. Uh, whoever came up with the term wasn't thinking. Don't confuse child pornography with pornography. It is a crime federal crime and a state crime to produce, sell, distribute child pornography. Uh, and the reason is that child pornography is evidence of the sexual abuse of children. In New York versus Ferber, uh, New York authorities prosecuted Mr. Ferber who had induced uh, a minor who was younger than 16 to engage in a sexual performance. Um, the, Mr. Ferber was convicted, his conviction was overturned, and so the state of New York appealed the reversal of his conviction to the Supreme Court. Uh, Ferber's defense was that, um, well, you know, this is art. The, the obscenity test should apply. And the Supreme Court said, no, the obscenity test does not apply because child pornography is not protected by the First Amendment. So child pornography, you could say, is like a law of general applicability. The First Amendment does not apply. Why is it a law of general applicability? Well, because there's a, a compelling government interest protecting the welfare of children. Uh, the part that's difficult is was the law specifically created to suppress expression? Uh, and you can read it one way that, well, you know, it's child porn, it's films, pictures, whatever, that's expression. But the expression is merely the recording of the act, the criminal act of sexually abusing a child. And the Supreme Court has no problem saying that it is denied the protection of the First Amendment. So keep that in mind. For purposes of our examination, we're going to make 16 years the cutoff age. If it's 16 and above, not child pornography. It's younger than 16, it is child pornography. In the United States versus Knox, we had another child pornography conviction. Now, in the Knox case, uh, Mr. Knox was selling videos of little kids uh, on a public playground and at a public swimming pool. The children were not naked. There was no actual sexual activity. But because the camera focused on the pubic areas of the children, even though they were wearing clothes, uh, he was convicted and the Third Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the convictions they said the films were intended to sexually arouse pedophiles, and that constituted the sexual abuse of children. Then, United States versus Excitement Videos, uh, 
uh, Tracy Lords. You might ask your parents about her. She was a famous porn star. She went to the Valley, California, where the porn industry was uh, based, and she talked her way onto an adult movie set. Uh, she convinced the, the people making the adult movie that she was, in fact, an adult when she was only 15. She made a number of X-rated films. Um, later, many years later, when she was an adult, a company, Excitement Videos, said, we're going to sell you a package of Tracy Lord's adult films, including her very first adult film. Well, that was a problem because her very first adult film was made when she was 15, so that was child pornography. And so the government prosecuted Excitement Videos. Excitement Videos said, well, Tracy Lord's is now in her 30s. How can this be child pornography? We're just uh, selling videos of this woman who is mature but the US attorney and the court said well her age now doesn't affect the fact that she was a minor when the x-rated movie was made that is still child pornography so keep that in mind Ashcroft versus free speech coalition um, because having actual children engage in sex is a crime with the development of computer graphics, uh, some people started to make child pornography using computer-generated characters. Uh, so Congress passed a law uh, making it a crime to distribute computer-generated child porn. That is to say, uh, making it a crime to sell uh, computerized characters engaging in sex who appeared to be children. That was challenged and the Supreme Court struck down the law saying there are no children, so it can't be child porn. It's just ones and zeros. It's all digital. Congress then uh, came up with a new way to approach this, and they said it's a crime to sell this virtual child pornography as actual child pornography. So uh, if you make a child porn film using these computer-generated characters, but you sell it as a film showing real children, well, that's a federal crime. And that covers uh, the lecture for the first part of the class. Uh, as you've seen in the previous lecture, I will be sending out the test Thursday. You will have 24 hours to return it. Uh, there will be additional instructions on the test and how to do that. But pretty much it's you'll get the test, you'll write your answers, you'll send them to me. As a word attachment, you'll also put your answers in the body of your email. I will then copy your test answers with your employee ID number onto new files, not linked to your email addresses, so that I can read them anonymously, and then I will get them back to you uh, with my comments and the grade. So be sure to send me blog questions about the materials. I will be doing a blog on Wednesday answering your questions and talking more about the exam. And then I'll be sending you uh, URLs for the videos for the libel and privacy portion of the class. <coughs> and that's it. Uh, good luck. Do the reading. Watch the videos. Uh, consider what the law is about. And I'll be speaking to you through video again on Wednesday. <coughs>